Welcome to Four Quarter Lives. I'm Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, and I'm exploring how longer lives impact everything, from careers and relationships to the very shape of our lives. Truth is, you're likely to live a lot longer than you think. I talk with a wide range of experts and academics, as well as individuals designing and redesigning their own third quarters, the years from 50 to 75. Instead of recreation, they're thinking recreation. What can we learn from their pioneering roadmaps through life? Carol Carlson has been a coach for Harvard Business School for over 20 years, and she's been accompanying participants in Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative, including me, since its founding. She is also, on the side, the director of the Heller MBA program at Brandeis University and a senior lecturer there. Author of a book titled Social Entrepreneurship, her lifelong passion for purposeful impact is the red thread throughout her coaching and teaching career. She's focused on unleashing it, which is very aligned with the purpose of ALI. There aren't many people who've been observing and supporting midlife transitions at senior leadership levels as closely as Carol. So I'm delighted to welcome her to Four Quarter Lives to share her takeaways and lessons from decades of experience. How to prepare, plan, and navigate your third quarter life. Carol Carlson, welcome to Four Quarter Lives. Well, thank you so much, Aviva. I'm really delighted to have a chance to interact with you in this way. I know, this is different. So you've been a coach of mine on the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative, which part of the package is to get a few hours with a wonderful coach. And I was, uh, we got a menu of options and I chose you with great pleasure and wisdom because it's already delivered big time. Maybe before we launch into our questions, tell me a bit about all your other roles and how you you came to be a coach with the Harvard program. Sure. So I have been coaching for Harvard for nearly two decades. That's wow. Harvard Business School primarily. And I was recruited from that group to actually make the transition over to coach ALI fellows in part because I really loved coaching HBS alumni. And so I think they thought I would have something to contribute. I think the other reason is because I'm an expert in entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, and that's very aligned with what ALI does. So to give you just a little bit more background, my other roles, when I'm not having the great pleasure of being interacting with you or being interviewed on your podcast, I am the program director, the MBA program director at the Heller School for Management and Social Policy at Brandeis University. We have a niche MBA program that is focused on social impact, usually for not pre-experienced individuals, but people who have a little bit of experience. And so I get to both direct the efforts of that program and also I'm a teacher, I'm an instructor there and have been for over a decade. And I teach courses in social entrepreneurship, healthcare entrepreneurship, global social entrepreneurship, and a little bit of strategy. So that's a lot of fun, but I can't give up on coaching because it's something I really, really enjoy. I like seeing an impact one to many, which is what I do in the classroom, but I also really, really love seeing an impact one to one. And I especially like doing that with adults. And that's not to say people in their 20s aren't adults, but I like working with people who are a little further along. And because their lives are more complicated and to me more interesting, and I can add a little bit more, hopefully, shared experience as a way to uh, help to move them to the next stage. And then in addition to that, I'm an author. I just released one book. It's called Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation, Five Stars on Google. So I'm happy about that. Or five stars on Amazon, rather. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm about to publish another, which is a case collection for social entrepreneurship. So I like to write. So pro- prolific, aligned all over the place, and very much, you're remarkably focused, I love it, on social impact and social entrepreneurship. Well, it's where my passion lies. And the way I came to this is when I graduated from business school, I was lucky enough to work for a really great consulting firm, Parthenon, now Parthenon, E&Y. And it was a wonderful experience. And I got to do the other thing I really love to do, which is go out and problem solve, which has a nice alignment with coaching. Yep. Yep. Not the only alignment, but one, one, one part of the alignment. But I, I left that because when my husband and I started a family, it was a very uh, difficult 
career to have. And so I was lucky enough to have a chance to be invited by HBS to do some coaching for them and also be invited to teach, which is why I ended up in an academic role. And that was a very interesting career transition, one I loved, but I couldn't let go of the coaching. And so I've kept on doing that all this time. Again, mainly ALI, Harvard alums, and then often my executive education students who need a little extra help thinking about their lives. What better expert could I have asked to help us? What I really love and why I really wanted to have you in this podcast was to give us a bit of an overview. There are very few people who are as familiar as you with something relatively new, which is how do we navigate these third quarter transitions? And you've been doing this for a long, long time. So ALI is now one of a number of programs that are actually fast multiplying. I think we're up to about a dozen and they're starting to spread around the world to help people transition in midlife. So what do you think are the impact of these programs on people's lives? You've accompanied them through that, this particular year and experience. What does it give them? Sure. Well, I'll say that the target of the ALI program are people who are have just made that transition into the third quarter or who are making that transition to the third quarter. And I think it's a really great time for thought and reflection. And so the programs that I'm aware of, um, abstracting a little more from ALI, are around helping people say, I've been a big success, however you define that. I've had an impact, work, family, life, intellectual, but I want to be able to have a little bit more gas around that going forward. I want to be able to, often people are leaving work, they're often retiring or planning for retirement, and they're thinking, how do I actually continue to have the kind of impact I've had in my professional life in a life that's a little bit more of a collection of different ways to have impact? Sometimes work is involved, but sometimes it's board leadership, often it's community leadership, sometimes it's starting an entirely new thing. And so that transition point is really interesting to me. And I love to guide people through that. So I think that's why the programs are so popular. It's because they're giving people an opportunity to do in good programs, I think, both a lot of self-reflection, but also some aperture opening, where you can say, I've been thinking about things in one way, but I really want to think about a little more broadly. And then I'll probably focus my efforts, but how do I open up and do a little bit more exploration of many things that interest me, hopefully in the company of peers who share a lot of the same concerns or values or interests that I do? And how do I do that as a way to do some planning, but also as a way to get the resources I need to affect a good transition. So I think those programs are wonderful for the people who embrace them in those ways. Yeah, yeah. there aren't quite enough of them. So uh, I'm delighted to see them starting, starting to catch on, right? So as you see people navigate, and it's only one year, which I think now being halfway through it myself goes remarkably quickly, as you know. And I don't know if there's even a typical in this question, how do people typically navigate through this program? What's the sort of arrival impression? What are the expectations they come with? And what do you see as the the impact of the results and the outcomes that they leave with? Sure. So I'm not really sure what the expectations are for people coming in. That seems like a very, very diverse set. But what I have seen is people, this is just like a graduate program, but it's almost a graduate program in life. They arrive, they immediately want to get to know their peers and learn from others. And so that happens. And then people who are using the program well um, engage deeply in the resources that Harvard has to offer. And boy, does Harvard have a lot of resources to offer. I always ask people who I'm coaching, what courses are you taking or who are you talking to? And what I hear back is a canon of intellectual power. I mean, it's just pretty amazing. So I think people do that for a time. And then because ALI... They run run around a lot at the beginning. I noticed it's like uh, more and more kids in a candy store, right? It's like... Yeah. So first there's kids in a candy store and then there's, well, I've learned something. I want to get more serious about a specific focus. And then um, the people who are using the program effectively start to assemble their ecosystem around that focus and figure out a way to advance that focus. And again, there's a lot of ways to do that. There have been a few people who've been looking to change jobs. Uh, There's a lot of people who are saying, 
I have 10 different solicitations in my, e- in, in my inbox asking yeah. me to be on a board. Which board yeah. do I choose? How do I make a choice? Or I've got 10 different young entrepreneurs who'd like to be advised by me. How do I figure out that dynamic? And then some people want to start something entirely new. Yep. So what are the big challenges people tend to be facing at this age? And say, I, I've been surprised often in interviews by how emotional and sometimes confused I'm putting myself in that category. You can be at this age and stage very unexpectedly because you're supposed to kind of be calmer, (laughs) be wiser. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I never think we're calm or wise enough. But the challenges people seem to be, I think, experiencing, and this is a big generalization because there's lots of sub-challenges, but I think the biggest thing is that everyone's learned how to do one or two or three things really well and had built a career on that. It's expertise, it's technical ability, it's sometimes leadership ability, but you've been on a train with respect to career achievement. And then at some point, you have to get off or you have to change the direction that train is taking. And figuring out how you transition a success pattern to a new set of success patterns, which could be very different in terms of the capabilities they require or the networks they require, I think it's the biggest challenge people run into. And so that's part of it. And then one of the interesting things I have the opportunity to do every year is I go to the Harvard Business School reunions, and at those reunions, they have coaching, and it's like sign up for half an hour, go see a coach. And I really like and always ask for the people who are in the older reunions, who are 30 years out of school or 40 years out of school, because those are the people that are facing those life transitions. And my train analogy, I think in particular for that group, but also for ALI, really applies to that group. And so I see success patterns being people who can figure out how to embrace and make that transition. And I also see some lack of success patterns, which are pretty significant. And I sort of walk away shaking my head What's the profile? What's the profile of the person who has trouble with these kind of Um, changes? I think one of the profiles, which is not on my train analogy, is people who've switched what they do every three or four or ten years. And so if somebody comes in and says, I've had five careers over five decades with no real connection between them, they end up feeling deeply dissatisfied about not having gained traction in an area where they can contribute. So that's one issue I think that people run into. That's not to say we shouldn't be flexible and agile in our careers. People will and do change careers, but I think there needs to be connective tissue between those careers rather than abrupt shifts, which I think can both be disconcerting at the time, but also leave people with less of a legacy. So that's one. A second one is, this is a little bit personal, but I think that many people who have regrets that I hear about in that forum, not ALI, but in this reunion coaching forum, are people who've underinvested in their families. Mm. And I can't tell you how many people I've heard say, I've had an amazing career, I've made a lot of money, look at me. And then it turns out they don't talk to their children or they've had an uneven family life. And I think that that's a big regret people have. And then I also think that one of the patterns that people run into, particularly highly successful and driven people, is maybe investing a little less in relationships more broadly. And so nobody ever comes in and says, I don't have any friends. But sometimes you can sense that people who are at transition points are really quite lonely because if all of their friends have been type X, business people you see in the office every day in the company you've worked with or possibly the company you've founded and you need to transition or want to transition to a place where your relationships are type Y or type Z or all over the alphabet, I think it's hard. It's hard to do because it's harder to form networks as we age. I can't resist to ask you any observable gender differences in these kind of issues, trends, what they're facing? Well, I, I, <laughs> there are observable gender differences. Some of them have to do with the pool, because if I'm looking at older reunions, there was a dominance of men at Harvard Business sure. School 20 or 30 years ago. Mainly, I'm talking about men, but I think if I talk to more women at these sessions, I'd see similar patterns. Yeah, yeah. 
One of the things I'm curious about is just the speed of transition. Do you think that, do people actually make the whole transition or does it take a lot longer? I find people are usually in quite a bit of a hurry to transition and these later transitions seem to me to maybe require a bit more time. What do you see? That's a really interesting question. And I think it might get back to, in a different way, something I was saying earlier, which is I think abrupt transitions can work. I mean, you can be a person who's always had a passion for something, sailing baseball, collecting baseball cards, you name it. And then when you no longer have the demands that you had a few years ago, you say, I'm done. Now all I'm going to do is spend my time on my baseball card collection or whatever it happens to be. But I think sometimes those abrupt transitions can be a little bit empty. I always thought that what I would really want to do is this, but when I abruptly transitioned my life to doing that, I found that it didn't meet my needs in some ways, for example. So the one year is not abrupt, but it's it's edging in on abrupt. It feels a little bit abrupt. And so if I was to give advice to a younger me and then a lot of other people, it would be to plan ahead and mm. to think about transitions and to think of, and to deeply think about what you'll find satisfying. And then because I like to think like an entrepreneur, um, maybe to test out that satisfaction. So if you think you're going to retire and get a gold watch and then your thing is going to be travel, but you haven't traveled in the way you would like to for 20 years, you're going to find it's very different than you imagined. So why not start experimenting with some of the things you'd like to do now? And that is often about your passions, but it's also about your environment. It's also about your friends, your network, your ecosystem. And so I and think I would encourage people... it's also people, often about your partner, right? What, you, you were expecting very to go and travel all over the place, and then the partner says, no, no, sorry, I've got different plans right now. Yeah, yeah. And so having a good on-ramp to any life change, I think, is really valuable. And I think this is particularly true for people who've gained a lot of their self-worth from a professional career that has to end. So, for example, I have a friend who is an airline pilot, and there's a time on his calendar, it's already happened, where he has to stop flying. And so many people The cliff edge, yeah. The cliff edge, but that's a really big cliff edge. It's when your birthday is this, you have to stop. And in his case, he was a very talented woodworker, and he had developed this side business and a side avocation in woodworking. And so he didn't experience the same cliff that many of his peers did. But many, many people get there, fall off the cliff, and then find that their expectations weren't realistic or were a little bit, or aren't practical. And there's all kinds of reasons. So good planning on-ramp, off-ramp. And if you get a lot of your self-worth around certain kinds of contributions, business, community, setting those things up in advance rather than saying that's what I'm going to do when I have time is a really good idea. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you're really kind of pointing to uh, an examined, well-lived, self-aware life construction over long periods that you kind of harvest towards the end, which is probably not all that typical, is it? I mean, what share of people actually build wisely like that and achieve that kind of satisfaction in the multiple pillars of their lives? There seems to be such a, from the workplace, such a push to choosing and prioritizing work over relationships and personal and community contributions. Yeah. I mean, I've seen people who've done that well. I've admired it. I'm seeking to emulate it. And so there are certainly people who get that right. And then I think there's certainly people who get that wrong. And again, I don't. you mentioned gender earlier. And I do think that often, not always, the people who get that wrong are men. And I think that's because of societal expectations of men in professional roles. And who often don't have a lot of other things in their life when they choose to or have to, in the case of my airline pilot friend, step down from those roles. Yep. So how could people better prepare for Q3? Now that you're working on these people at this stage, what would you tell them and all your, your younger students in their MBA? So, so what should they learn in Q2? What should they start building? That's a really interesting question. 
I think one thing they should probably learn or start building has to do with, as I mentioned earlier, their primary relationship or their family relationships. That's one thing that I think foundationally, when I think about happy people in Q2 or Q3 versus unhappy people in Q3, that seems to be a differentiator. Which is, which so, is very much with that Harvard, that famous Harvard longitudinal study over however many, 70 or 80 years has really underlined that relationships in the end are the biggest predictor to happiness. So yeah, rooted very, in Q2. Very, <laughs> yeah, very, very important. But I think the other things to plan for are how do you want to participate as you move into Q3? And we talked a little bit about leisure, the sort of travel theory. But I think there are a lot of people who want to participate professionally and make a contribution, sometimes by coaching others. In the cases I tend to talk about or think about is coaching young entrepreneurs. Sometimes it's doing a different kind of investment that they might not have. Sometimes it's a um, it's taking something they've done professionally but transitioning it in a way that they can do it for longer. Not my airline pilot, but um, I spent a lot of time with doctors who've become entrepreneurs in the healthcare space, things like that. Yep. How familiar do you think, or how much advanced planning do do you feel people do about Q? Do they even know that Q3 exists, that there will be this phase? I mean, I think most people still are in this one day, I will retire mode. Do you think it helps if there's more awareness of the existence of this now rather long, late phase of life and potential engagement? I think being aware of it is really important. And I was hinting at this earlier, but I think that being aware of it and then thinking about how you want to be in Q3 is valuable. But I, again, drawing on my entrepreneurial interests, the value of experimentation If you have some strong hypotheses or theories about how that's going to be for you, why not go and test them? And so... What the youngsters called side hustles. So they should start a whole bunch of side hustles. Maybe, or side hustles. I I mean, on the professional side and then on the personal side, going back to my travel analogy, if your image is of yourself backpacking rough through the Andes, but you're not going to do that until you retire. I mean, by all means, go out and do that first so that you have a sense of whether that's actually something that you'll find fulfilling. Yeah. And so testing your ideas, I think, makes sense. And I like to draw a series of circles for people. And I can't obviously draw them on a podcast, but it's a, it's a series of pie charts, essentially. And one of the things I've asked people to do when we're talking about how they're thinking about the next few years is to draw a pie chart every five years about how much time you want to invest in different things, professional activities, leisure, family, community, and then to see how those pie charts change over time. And a typical way that they might look is that um, when you're 60 or 50, a very dominant share of that pie chart is going to be work and possibly a dominant share will be family as well. But when you're a little bit older, your family obligations, when you're an empty nester like I am, have transitioned away. So they're smaller. Uh, Your work obligations often change a little bit. And going through the process of thinking about what does your pie chart look like every five years for the next 20 years, I think really forces to people to think about what they want, but also what they're prepared for. So if the enormous part of the pie chart ends up being community or travel or entrepreneurship, have they actually laid the groundwork for doing that in an effective way? And that's what you should be thinking about now. Yeah. And the awareness of how dramatically those pie charts can evolve over those periods that you will not be the same person with the same motivations. How familiar are people with their future selves? How do you build awareness of that next chapter? That's, I mean, I I think that was a rhetorical question, but, or a philosophical question. How familiar are we with our future selves? I mean, it's really hard to be familiar with your future self because it requires you to first be a disciplined thinker and secondly, to imagine scenarios, some of which might feel very good and some of which may be a little less comfortable and also being aware of and thinking through limitations you might encounter, financial limitations, health limitations, other things that might um, impair your ability to be the self that we're all experiencing today. 
And yes, and I, th- I, I find that since it's a very often a very difficult and uncomfortable sort of invitation of thinking, people just avoid it and don't do it, which is an easy kind of cop out, but leaves them without the kind of planning and invitation to build the building blocks of that future plan early enough. But considering how important it is to your ultimate satisfaction, that really seems like something that's worthy of a little investment. I mean, I don't like going to the dentist for tooth cleanings. But every time I do it, I feel like, okay, this is an investment. (laughs) Did you? Yeah. It's an investment in my dental health, which is important. For planning for your future, that's an investment in your personal health. And it also, I think, helps you identify where there might be some gaps that you haven't thought through. And not for everyone, but for a lot of people, one of those gaps is financial. Yeah. How do you know what do I realistically need to do going into my third quarter to have the kind of lifestyle that I would like to? Which increasingly, I imagine, means we're have to, we're going to all have to work a lot longer than we might have been planning. Aha! Uh-huh. But if that's going to happen, why not work at something you really love? And planning today for those transitions enables you to do that. Yeah. So I've enjoyed a number of coaching sessions with you. You know exactly what I think about most things. Um, By this age and stage and level, especially in an ALI program, we have the sense, I think, that we should have our shit completely together and be in control (laughs) and know what we do and make wise choices. And I've often been surprised at how emotional and lost and confused people can be. Do you agree? What, what What do you sense and feel and this whole longevity? We don't have role models. We're not really following in the steps of our parents. So this generation that you are now working with feels a little bit shocked by this sudden lengthening of their lives and this adjustment is can be really challenging. Do you agree? Well, I, I completely agree. And I think particularly for successful people, there yeah. is a feeling that they should have their stuff together. And it's a real challenge to self when they find out that perhaps they don't. and But it's also, I think, hard for people to be vulnerable and say, I thought I would be all aligned with all of this, but I'm not. And so one of the things that ALI and other programs enable people to do, I think, nobody's vulnerable their first week. But then you end up looking around and seeing some of your peers who are struggling with some of the same issues. I see some gaps in my in my interest, I can't have the kind of experience or I can't have the kind of impact I would like to. This problem is too big for me to solve and I don't have the resources that will enable or to solve alone and I don't have the resources that will enable me to do that. And you look around and say, wow, other people are also experiencing this kind of challenge. I think it's very empowering for people to see that because it's an intense environment where I think that you learn deeply about others in a way that you wouldn't necessarily do over coffee with a colleague or a friend where the conversation naturally sort of turns to the light instead of the heavy. Yeah, I think you're pointing to the cohort effect, the community issue that you no longer at least feel alone in your slight feeling of insanity. Um, that you're, yeah. you're in, a, in a place where everybody feels a little bit that they're going through some degree of lostness, even if that means that you know, they no longer have that 50-person team that used to take care of everything. Um, now they're on yeah. their own. But there's... I believe that you can probably build that cohort or community outside of ALI or outside of a program. I think it just takes some conscious effort to think about who would I like to have in my community. And then I think it takes even more conscious effort to take relationships which are fundamentally superficial and move them to a deeper level. And you do that, people do that in different ways. Sometimes it's spending more time with people, sometimes it's proximity, but it's sometimes opening conversations that you wouldn't normally have in a superficial social space. Somebody says, how are you? And you say, well, you know, I've really been struggling with this. I think that's something people have gotten more comfortable saying over the last couple of years, particularly with COVID. But those are the things that deepen relationships. And so there are ways to do that. I think the other thing you mentioned that I just wanted to pick up on for a moment is role models. And it's hard to find good role models. But I think one thing 
that you can do is you're thinking or planning ahead for the next stage of your life, for the next 20 years, is think about who do I think really does this well? Who do I admire that seems to have successfully navigated some of these pitfalls? And then why not go sit down with them and interview them or talk to them and say, what did you do? Why did you do it? How do you feel about it? Uh, You might find that they too don't have their stuff together, but you likely will get some ideas as well around how you can navigate your own challenges. Yeah, I think the the lack of role models is huge. So I'm tempted to close with do you have one and who was it? And is, do you have your own inspiration of how you are navigating this phase and the next one? Well, like everyone else, I'm struggling with that a little bit. Um, yeah. I do have some semi-role models, some people who I think I can learn things from. I haven't yet seen the whole role model where it's like, I want to do exactly what that person has done. That possibly would be a flawed approach anyway, because that wouldn't be well-tuned to me. Many of the people who I'm working with in ALI are role models for me. I see the transitions they've gone through and I go, wow, they've got that. I'm I'm borrowing that. Um, yeah. You, Aviva, are a role model to me. You may not realize that, but there you go. No, I really don't. And, I don't. I don't feel like that at all right now, as you well know. Yeah, and then I'm looking at my my siblings, for example, the choices they've made, and there's some there are some things there, and then also some of my peers. But it's hard to get that. So you've yeah. reminded me that when I'm making my list of things to do tomorrow, role models is going to be right up there. Think about and interact a little bit more with people who I think I can learn from. And that's a big goal of this podcast is trying to feature people who are navigating this transition constructively and proactively. And what I'm really hearing from you, which I find really fascinating, is there's a lot of talk, and you pointed to it, that we should be investing financially in much longer lives. We have to work longer or save more, do all of those things. But what you're also saying is we really have to get more skilled relationally and invest much more mindfully and earlier in building relationships for the long haul and not just professional ones, but community, personal, all the support fabric of a longer life. I think that's right. So thank you for putting that so beautifully. (laughs) Any closing thoughts? We've done a lot of work on and your working intimately with Q2 and Q3. So uh, this is very much the the sort of heart of adulthood. I'm always very conscious that there's this Q4 piece coming along. Do you think about that at all? Do the people you coach think about that at all? What do they, how are we going to end our lives? You know, I think that even though, you know, there's there's an old saying that the cobbler's children wear, wear the worst shoes. And I think as a coach, I should be more attuned to that issue. And I think I'm in denial about it. I think Mm -hmm. I am not spending the time planning for or thinking about Q4 in the way I probably should. So I think people should do that, and I think I should do that, but it hasn't hasn't happened the extent that I'd like to invest. I'm still a little bit whipsawed navigating Q3, to be honest. Uh, But I know I will have to. So that too it, we'll, is we'll come back to it. It'll be a future podcast. We'll come back to how do you prepare for Q4. <laughs> <laughs> but one one thing you asked if there was anything in closing, and as we were talking, I was thinking about my friend David, the airline pilot, and I thought that I think it, there's something really interesting there because the investments he made really enabled him to do things ultimately he was passionate about. So he had, had to stop flying at a certain age way younger than I thought you probably should. He had this woodworking construction passion, helped his kids renovate their houses, did things like that. But he also lived in a community which really was attuned to giving. And at some point he realized that he could go on or organize with his community Habitat for Humanity trips. And so what could be better for Habitat for Humanity than having a skilled woodworker who really wants to dedicate their time, has a lot of time on his hands, and can travel anywhere in the world for free Absolutely. as a retired My pilot. Oh, gosh, yes, and of course. Oh, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> what a he resource. Had the opportunity, what a resource. And he had the opportunity to, to realign what he did in a way that enabled him to make a contribution. He was truly passionate about taking a community thread, a personal interest thread, and then this funny benefit you get when you retire from flying planes 
and put them together in a way that really worked. And so that is what I hope everyone is able to do. The red threads tying together in the final harvest. Carol Carlson, thank you so much for inspiring us with words of wisdom and accompaniment. And thank you personally for uh, helping me through. Pleasure. Until next time, we'll come back for Q4. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Thanks for joining this conversation about Four Quarter Lives, where we're designing lives that don't just get longer, but better. For more, you can follow my columns at Forbes or read my own account of a year back at school at Harvard in my newsletter on Substack called Elderberries. 